So good morning, everyone. The presentation portion of our session today will be recorded for potential future use in the museum's virtual programs. If you do not wish to appear in the recording, just a reminder that we ask you to please turn off your camera and also remember to mute yourself unless you have a question to ask or comment to make when we move to the discussion portion of the program. My name is Carla Rasmussen and I am the programs manager for the WGM organization. I'm still working out of the Moose Jaw location, but officially I work for our corporate office in Saskatoon. A big welcome to everyone joining us from around the province today. My coworker Dave is joining us remotely behind the scenes from Saskatoon and will be helping to run the technical side of the presentation. He will also be looking after the chat, and should you have any questions or would like to share a memory or a comment, please note it in the chat function at the bottom of your screen at any time during the prep program, and then we'll circle back around to those at the conclusion. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the WDM Moose Jaw is located on Treaty 4 territory and the homeland of the Métis. This is a traditional territory of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota First Nations, and the Métis people. The WDM is committed to working towards a new relationship anchored in the spirit of the treaties and to educating Saskatchewan people about their shared history of treaty making. I'd like to throw this over right now to our special guest and I'll introduce her first. Uh, this is Kareen Dalek, who is the content specialist for the Western Development Museum and Kareen also works out of our corporate office in Saskatoon. So welcome to Kareen. Thank you, Carla. And I'd also like to just take a moment to um, begin by acknowledging that the WDM corporate office is located on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. Uh, this is the traditional territory of the Cree, Soto, Dene, Dakota and Nakota First Nations and the Métis people. I acknowledge with gratitude our ability to learn and find fellowship with one another on this land today. Back to you, Carla. Thank you. Sorry, I got a little distracted there. I was off on mute there. So, <laughs> so that's good. So, uh, yeah, we have we have four different locations at the WDM, and uh, I think that Kareen's presentation kind of touches on all of them in some way, shape, or form. We've got uh, artifacts that we're very excited to share with you. Um, homemade Saskatchewan is Kareen's theme. Um, so, I'll maybe uh, kind of just go over some of the stuff we've been sharing a script back and forth here. So, uh, I'm going to read a little bit of, of this here, and uh, that way, if I miss anything. Kareen can probably follow up on it as well. Um, so something interesting at the corporate office, uh, it's a storage facility for almost half of the WDM's 75,000 artifacts. And around 55% of the artifacts are on display at the exhibit locations, which are in Moose Jaw, North Battleford, Saskatoon, and Yorkton. Um, and this is an amazing number when you consider that most Canadian museums only have 30 to 35% of their collections on display. The corporate office also houses a conservation lab, a non-lending research library, and the administrative offices of the WDM. Kareen, would you like to take it from here and move into the bulk of your program? Is that all right? All right. So at the WDM, we love to hear and share stories about Saskatchewan. We're lucky because Saskatchewan, in Saskatchewan, there are so many interesting, innovative, and creative people who have used their ingenuity skills and skills to create, build, and inspire others. Whoops, sorry, yeah, it was, it was going. I just had to, yeah, okay. Um, we see stories like this from the development of the Cobalt 60 Radiation Treatment Unit at the University of Saskatchewan. It's a well-known example of this ingenuity as it is a desire to create something to make the world a better place. We see another kind of ingenuity in the story of world-renowned singer and songwriter Joni Mitchell, who was raised in Saskatchewan. Today I'll be sharing some less well-known Saskatchewan stories of people who, who <laughs> sorry, stories of people who created out of a need because of their circumstances, because of a desire to keep traditions alive, or just because they enjoyed tinkering and ended up creating something unique and imaginative. The stories that I'm sharing with you today were originally compiled in 2013 and 2014 for a special project that the WDM was invited to participate in. 
Narrative Threads, Crafting the Canadian Quilt was a virtual exhibit hosted by the Textile Museum of Canada. They invited five museums from across Canada to participate with the WDM contributing 25 artifact stories to this virtual exhibit. I was one of the WDM contributors to the project. I'd also like to recognize my past and present WDM colleagues, Christine Flynn, Heather Engelbert, and Ruth Bittner, whose research I'll also be sharing. So let's get started with something that was created out of necessity. Use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. This might have been the anthem of prairie folk struggling to survive the dirty 30s. In Western Canada, a decade of drought and worldwide depression dealt a double whammy, forcing thousands to a hand-to-mouth existence, scraping by to make ends meet. With growing families to clothe, ingenious mothers turned flour and sugar sacks into underwear, pajamas, shirts, and even dresses. Sacks were bleached and hung on clotheslines in the blazing sun to remove the offending labels. Still, many a child wore traces of Little John Oats or Robin Hood flour on their back or bottom. Pieced together and trimmed with a bit of embroidery, flour sacks also made serviceable aprons and dish towels, curtains, and quilts. Though times were tough, those who lived through the Depression often commented they were all in it together. Folks gathered for dances and card parties, skating or ball games, and any outing that did not cost much. One tradition that outlasted the 30s was tinged with black humor as party goers dressed as hobos or bums for hard times dances. Prizes were given for the best get-ups. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it. I'd never heard of any of these till we started doing any of the research. In the late 1940s, Eleanor Wagner from the Craven area transformed rolled oats and flour sacks into fetching mother and daughter costumes for the local hard times dance at Kennel Country School. Instead of removing the telltale evidence, she cleverly placed logos and printing to best advantage. Her three-piece outfit of a sleeveless top, skirt, and long sleeve jacket were emblazoned with brand names decades before that became fashionable. A Victor Oates Tam, Windsor salt handkerchief, and homemade button jewelry complemented the hard times theme. Wagner decked out her young daughter in a delightful little Robin Hood sack pinafore. And I, we found this little poem when we were doing our research and I thought it was too cute not to include. Panty waist that stood the test, had pure Alberta sugar across my chest. No lace or ruffles to enhance, just Quaker oats upon my pants. <laughs> While the WDM collection contains a variety of artifacts made from flour and sugar sacks, these are by far the most creative examples. So another story of ingenuity born from necessity, although for different reasons, is the homemade banjo made by Olaf Turnbull. Olaf Turnbull learned a love of music, a thirst for knowledge, and a willingness to serve his community from his father. Music was a big part of life on the Turnbull farm near Kindersley, as friends gathered around the piano while his father sang. For Olaf, music would be a lifelong love. The harsh conditions of the Great Depression could not squelch teenaged Olaf's passion for music. Someone gave him an old banjo head, so he decided to finish the job using materials he found around the farm. He started construction using measurements from another banjo. For the neck, he scrounged pieces from a wagon tongue. A part of the banjo tailpiece was made from the fan off of a combine. To place the frets along the neck, Olaf laid a darning needle across the neck in various places determined to determine where the frets should be placed. Then using the sounds of the proper notes on a piano, he figured out where to put the frets to get the correct pitch. He ordered tuning pegs from the Eaton's catalog and the resonator was made from the top of a barrel which he cut out and drilled. The backing was made of birch turned on a lathe. He had no mother of pearl to use as an inlay on the back, so he used pieces of aluminum salvaged from his mother's old cooking pots. Olaf made the case for the banjo, lined it with blue fabric, and used latches from another case to keep it closed. 
Olaf said he played for many a dance with his homemade banjo. The banjo was the first instrument that Olaf owned, but it wasn't the only way he made music. In 1937, Olaf saw a picture of a saxophone in a catalog and decided that mastering the sax would be his next challenge. But $60 was far beyond what he could afford. So the resourceful Olaf found another saxophone and convinced the owner to part with it for $25. The following year, Olaf and five musical friends borrowed a car and struck out on an Alberta tour. However, fame and fortune eluded them, leaving the band with barely enough money to get home. A career in music was not to be for Olaf. Instead, he devoted his life and serv to service as a farmer, educator, and politician. Following his studies at the University of Saskatchewan, Olaf returned to the family farm where he got involved with the Saskatchewan Farmers Union, or SFU. His work with the SFU led him into the world of politics. Olaf was elected to the Saskatchewan Legislative Assembly where he became a cabinet minister. As it turned out, Olaf wasn't done with music yet. Years later, after retiring from teaching at the College of Agriculture at the University of Saskatchewan, Olaf joined a group called the Most Amazing Hobby Band, playing gigs around Saskatoon, and he did that until his death in 2004 at the age of 86. Olaf donated his banjo to the WDM in 2003. When he gave it to us, he quoted a Chinese proverb saying that a life without music would be a mistake. That is probably why he treasured his homemade banjo so much. And we're very lucky to have it here. My next story is a bit of a sad one. It shows how one person's loneliness led him to create something unique to help ease his feelings of isolation. For, Ukra sorry, for Ukrainian immigrant Victor Humaniak, his home near Fenwood was a lonely place. Victor was near middle age when he left his native country sometime around 1930 for a new life in Canada. A private and solitary man, he had only his memories of family and a special girlfriend for company. Perhaps pining for his lost love, in 1936, Victor found good-sized poplar logs, took out his knife and began to carve. Two figures eventually emerged, an image of a woman he had left, sorry, an image of the woman he had left behind, and the other was his own likeness. The figures have movable parts so they can sit or stand. Victor dressed the male figure in his own clothes. Neighbors said that he trusted his carved friends more than he did other people. Victor was married briefly in the 1960s, but the relationship did not last. Alone again, he died on January 1, 1976, at the age of 84. Before his death, the two figures were parted. Victor gave the male figure to his neighbors, the Matichucks. Bill Matichuk recalled that they used to keep the figure on the porch and people would get scared because it looked so real. The Matichucks, Matichucks decided to give the figure to the WDM. Victor entrusted the female figure to his stepdaughter, Olga Wilk. Not knowing its companion was already there, Olga had the same idea as the Matichucks and in 1976 gave the female figure to the museum. Olga said, it's good that the two are together. The figures are now among the WDM Yorkton's most popular artifacts. Together, they now tell their poignant story of separation and lost love. Turning to our next story, Keeping family and cultural traditions alive has long been an important part of life on the prairies and elsewhere. We see this in activities and crafts like the Ukrainian tradition of making fazanka at Easter, in Métis jigging, and even putting up a tree at Christmas. One traditional craft featured in the WDM collection is birch bark biting. For Saskatchewan artist Angelique Morasti, birch bark biting was both a cultural and a family tradition. Angelique belonged to the Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation in Northeast Saskatchewan. She learned the art from her mother, Susan Ballantyne, and by watching competitions among the women near her home. A determined student, Angelique noted, I would sit there for hours and I ended up wasting a lot of birch bark, 
But what kept me going was that I knew that this was special and this was what I wanted to do. Adopted as Saskatchewan's official tree in 1988, the white birch is recognizable by its white paper-like bark. Birches grow abundantly in Saskatchewan from the southern hills to the boreal forest of the north. Angelique's husband, Bill, collected bark from the forest surrounding their island home on Amisk Lake, which was formerly known as Beaver Lake, if you've heard of it. It's near Denaire Beach. The best pieces, clean and free from knots, are harvested when the trees are young and supple. Up to 10 layers are carefully separated, about half of which are usable for biting. Angelique used square pieces of bark folded in half, then into smaller squares and finally corner to corner into triangles. Using mainly her eye teeth and varying the pressure and angle of her bite, she created intricate designs of different shapes and shades. Her pictures ranged in size from 7 to 38 centimeters or 5 to 16 inches square. At first Angelique unfolded the bark several times to check the pattern, but as her skill and confidence grew, she could see the designs in her mind's eye. Angelique put her own spin on the traditional styles of her mother, moving on to complicated designs patterned on nature. Flowers, caterpillars, bees, moose, or birds emerged from the bark as she mastered the art. At her peak, Angelique could create a small biting in as little as two or three minutes. When Angelique was fitted with false teeth, those around her worried that her birch bark biting days were over, but wearing dentures did not put an end to her bitings. Some even claimed that the denturist crafted her eye teeth to suit her art. Angelique was once thought to be among the last practicing birch bark biters. She had no daughter to pass along the art as her mother had done. But in the early 80s, someone came along wanting to learn. Now hopefully this doesn't get too con confusing, but when Angelique Morasti Levac of Uranium City saw what appeared to be her own name on a magazine, she felt compelled to travel to meet her namesake and learn her craft. In 1981, Levac showed up on the elder Morasti's doorstep in the middle of a prairie blizzard, eager to learn from her. They soon became best friends, spending time together looking for birch bark and peeling it. Angelique Morasti passed away in 1996. Together with a number of other artists, including Teresa and Rosie McLeod from Stanley Mission, June McCallum Garreau from Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation, and now also Morasti Levac's granddaughter, Mercedes Angelique Levac, they are carrying on this traditional First Nations art. In recognition of Angelique Morasti's importance as an artist, Five of her birch bark bitings from the WDM collection were recently loaned to the Remy Modern Gallery in Saskatoon and were part of their exhibition called In the Middle of Everywhere, Artists on the Great Plains, which was on display from May 2022 to March 2023. Next up is the interesting story of Peter Rupchan, considered by many as Saskatchewan's first potter. Peter's story tells of a desire to create and the extraordinary lengths he went to to create his art. Before coming to Saskatchewan in 1905, Peter had worked as a potter in Ukraine. This is where he became skilled in pottery. Peter followed his family to Canada, settling in the Endeavour Usherville area in Saskatchewan's Parkland region. Later that year, Perry Peter married Safta Safrak from Kenora. Neither a natural farmer nor greatly interested in agriculture, he and Safta moved six times from homestead to homestead before proving up or gaining the title to his land. As I understand from my reading, that was because he was looking for the proper clay in his soil. Peter's true passion for pottery, an unusual interest in Saskatchewan at the time, he was determined to pursue his craft and spent two years searching for that right clay soil. Peter built his own pottery wheel and wood-fired earthen kiln. He created his own glazes from glass salvaged from the dump and used a windmill to power a machine to grind the glass. 
Peter's reputation as a skilled potter grew. He often made traditional Eastern European pottery styles. Catering to his Ukrainian neighbors, he made specialized items such as makitras, which are used to grind and crush poppy seeds, um, which is very popular in traditional Ukrainian cooking. And if I mispronounce that, anyone with a Ukrainian background can let me know <laughs> the proper way to pronounce it. I tried looking it up. So. <laughs> a well-known figure in his home area, Peter made his rounds from farm to farm, town to town, peddling his wares. He often told stories as he sold items from the cart loaded with bowls, crocks, flower pots, plates, cups, toys, whistles, and more. And thanks to the research of author Judith, Judith Silverthorne, we know that Peter would sell his pottery from five cents for a whistle to 45 cents for a two gallon crock. It usually took him about a week or two to sell a load of pots, bringing in a total revenue of only 50 to $80. He worked hard to make a living doing something that he loved. Peter died in 1944 following a logging accident. And even though nearly 80 years has passed, his legacy as a pioneer in prairie pottery continues. Not only can his work be found at the WDM, but also in the collections of the Ukrainian Museum of Canada, the Canadian Museum of History, and the Saskatchewan Craft Council. And now moving on from cultural traditions to something completely different. Ingenuity used to create something unique and unusual, a life-sized mechanical horse. This is Blowtorch, who became a well-known and well-loved part of local parades and fairs in the 1950s and 1960s in the Swift Current area. Blowtorch was inventor W.J. McIntyre's pet project and his best known invention. W.J. ran a scrap metal and foundry business in Swift Current and founded the Inventors Association of Canada in the 1950s. He built his first mechanical horse around 1947 and spent five years improving on the prototype. The final result was Blowtorch, the only horse in the world you have to choke to start. McIntyre dressed the sheet metal body with black and white pinto paint, a black and white pinto paint job and horse hair, mane, and tail. Inside Blowtorch, the horsepower came from a nine horsepower gasoline engine. Blowtorch could move up to 12 kilometers or 7.5 miles per hour. A rider controlled the horse with a foot throttle to speed up and a brake cable to slow down. McIntyre put small wheels under the hooves so that the horse could move when its legs slid back and forth. The result was its signature odd lurching gait. Word spread about McIntyre and Blowtorch. The duo was invited to appear in a Grey Cup parade in Toronto, the Red River Exhibition in Winnipeg, and several other events across Canada. McIntyre reportedly received a letter from Walt Disney asking about his mechanical invention. When McIntyre died in 1965, it seemed that Blowtorch was permanently out to pasture. A few years later, welder Alan Jacobs at McIntyre's old shop noticed a neglected Blowtorch rusting away. Jacobs and McIntyre's son decided to restore Blowtorch and brought the beloved horse out for one last parade in Swift Current in 1968. You can see the lovely Carla in our photo there too. <laughs> Now I've got something special to share, uh, a short video of Blowtorch in action. And this footage is from the 1950s. I hope you guys got a kick out of that video as much as I do. I've watched it over and over again because I, <laughs> I, I, I love the reactions of the other horse and then that, that he falls over but at the end, but anyway. Pretty amazing little creature. <laughs> and those are just a few of the uh, clever, beautiful, and wacky creations made by Saskatchewan people. I've come to the end of my, my presentation. I hope you enjoyed this glimpse into the WDM Artifact Collection. Thanks for taking part today. I'm going to pass it over to Carla again.
Well, thanks, Crane. That was great. We'll talk about some of those fabulous things in a moment or two. But before we move into the discussion portion, uh, as you can see on the screen up ahead there, I'd like to let you know that I'll be leading our next WDM Virtual Coffee Club at 10 a.m. on Tuesday, June the 27th. And our topic will be Saskatchewan Watercraft. I actually first made this program for a local Sea Cadet Corps uh, last year as they were kind of coming out of their pandemic protocols and they need some virtual programming. So um, it's, it's kind of an interesting one. We've got um, some past ships all the way up through today, so it's kind of interesting that way. Uh, I hope that you'll join us then, and if you enjoyed today's presentation, we encourage you to tell your friends. Please remember to complete the feedback survey that was emailed out to you with your confirmation letter. Well, thanks again to everybody who's joined us today. Remember to tune in next month for our final series of this year uh, on the watercraft of Saskatchewan. And uh, we'll be doing a little bit of a hiatus for the summertime, but we hope to be back in September. And we'll be sending out uh, reminders to everybody who's been a past registration registrant for the program before, letting you know the new dates and topics as soon as we have those confirmed. So have a good rest of your day, everyone, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>